On this jam-packed episode of This Week in Linux, we got a huge release from Blender with Blender 2.80, Linux Mint has released their latest version of 19.2, and System76 announced a brand new laptop. We'll also check out some Linux kernel news because Valve is proposing some new game-friendly changes to the, to the kernel, and there's some news regarding floppy drives of all things. We also got some more exciting news from Valve as they teamed up with Collabra to develop a project to bring the Linux desktop into the virtual reality space. There's also a new release for the Latte Dock, which is version 0.9. Manjaro made some waves this week, and Purism announced the final specs for the Librem 5. Later in the show, we'll check out some more Linux gaming news regarding the official Valve Steam Play whitelist. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimizing, managing, and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. You can get all this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. DigitalOcean also makes things for the community such as the 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. You can get started on DigitalOcean for one month for free with a $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. That's do.co slash tux. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with a $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. And thanks again for DigitalOcean for sponsoring This Week in Linux. A first in the show this week is some huge news from Blender. Blender has released version 2.80 or 2.80 this week. And this is got a, it's packed with a lot of amazing features and improvements and enhancements and overall just a ton of stuff. So let's just get started on what they've changed. First of all, they've changed a big amount of the user interface. They've redesigned a ton of the interface. They've also changed it where you can use left click for selection now as a default behavior and you can choose it when you first load uh, Blender which one you want to use. So if you are a long term user and you're used to the right click for selection which is like no new user is, uh, you can choose to use the right click if you like to, but by default now it's left click, which is great because, well, it's weird that it's been right click for 20 years. Anyway, there's also done a new real-time renderer called Eevee, and they've improved some cycle stuff like for performance. They've added new widgets and toolbars. They've added support for Grease Pencil 2D. They've added uh, new application templates, so you can have different uh, application or like UI st- specific tasks so for video editing, uh, 3D modeling, 2D animation, sculpting, VFX, and all kinds of stuff. So you can easily switch in between which, which mode you're working on in the new version of tw- 2.80. So there's actually quite a few things that it's you know there's there's it's hard to say because of how much has changed because they've been working on this for like four years or so. So there's so many things that have changed that it's uh, you know there's it's hard to pick any in any individual thing because so much has uh, but there's a new dark theme that has new refreshed icons and a bet and a new look they've got a new favorites menu that makes it easier to uh, m- manipulate your you know favorite tasks that you like to do they've added new startup templates for the video editing VFX and everything and especially like I've been a, I've been using blender for a very long time in a variety of ways but there's such a huge learning curve in every aspect of Blender that it makes it difficult to get started in various parts of it. So, for example, I started using video, the video editor previously, and it was it was super weird because it was super specific in how the workflow was built and how it like it didn't make any sense because it didn't look like a video editor. It just looked like uh, editing features slapped into something that wasn't meant to do it. But now, with this newest version, I have tested out well, a little bit of testing with the latest version that has changed the interface completely, so it feels like a video editor now, which is really cool. I mean, there's there's some tweaks that I'm going to make anyway, just to do it for testing and stuff. But overall, it's awesome that they're doing this. That they did so much changes and they made the video editing so much more like you know. Ex- fitting the expectations of people who already do video editing because there's a certain uh, structure and interface that has been like the standard for a very long time and they were kind of ignoring it and now they're actually implementing it so that's awesome Um, but anyway blender is a fantastic editor 
uh, in various different ways. Like it's whether you're doing 3D animation, where you're doing uh, 2D animation, where you're doing 3D modeling, whatever. Blender can do a ton of awesome stuff. So like the list goes on for all the changes. Um, but overall, like there's a lot of cool stuff. For like, for example, we talked about the EV, and it's a new physically based real time renderer. It works on both as a, as a renderer for final frames as well as an engine driving Blender's real-time viewport for creating assets. So you can actually get rendering in real-time as you're building it. So it makes it faster in the long run for the final render, but it also makes it where you see things that you're working on in a more clear detail rather than just you know in the, the model structure and then having to look after the render to see what it looks like. It's really cool. So if you're interested, I'll have a link to the sh in the show notes for Blender 2.80 because, well... I'm personally really excited to try out in a more, you know, bigger scale the video editing part of it because, like, I know for a long time that Blender's been a really good video editor, but it also has been, like, a really huge learning curve. And in order to do certain things, you'd have to do, like, 15 different functions just to get something that seems simple. And this one, based on my current testing, seems a lot more uh, geared towards actual, like, streamlined video editing. So I look forward to that. Again, I have a link to 2.80 of Blender in the show notes. Up next in the show is Linux Mint. Linux Mint 19.2 has been released. This is the latest version of the Mint distro. It has support for up to uh, until 2023 based on the 18.04 LTS. of like It's based on Ubuntu. So the 18.04 LTS of Ubuntu is supported until 2023, and Mint is going to be uh, also supporting it for that long as well. So there's a lot of stuff that's coming in this new version. It's actually just a mainly a maintenance version, a maintenance release on the uh, like the the main 19.x series. However, there's quite a few things that have been added to this as a nice improvement to the UI and the experience. So, for example, first, probably the biggest thing is that they've uh, updated their update manager to now include info on how long a kernel is supported, as well as switching kernels, making making it easier with the ability to add multiple, add and remove multiple kernels through the GUI. So they've also improved the preferences structure because they've added a, the newly introduced XApp G settings widgets are now easier and more simplified to use for the preferences. They've also done some user interface improvements such as the list of updates refreshes automatically, add up automatically when the apt cache is changed. The info dialog updates in real time. A warning is shown if a reboot is required for a kernel update, which is great because a lot of times uh, some distros don't have an update, don't warning that you, so you don't necessarily need, know that if it, it needs to actually reboot. And this is great because they're adding that f if it's necessary. And a dedicated page is also now used uh, as a when a, when the, the ma manager itself is has a new version available for like an update. So it has like a separate thing, so like you know that this is for the actual update manager. Previously, it would just show like. Uh, mint update as a indicator as a part of the updates in general. So that's nice that they're making it you know look more clean that way. So overall, this is great. If you're a Linux Mint fan, you should definitely go check it out because the latest version will have a lot of uh, a lot of new benefits to you. Uh, if you are just using the 19.1, you probably like you you should be able to upgrade pretty in, like seamlessly from 19.1 to 19.2. They typically have during the periods of the X series, so if you have like 19.0, 19.1, 0, 0.2, and 0.3, all of those have a pretty easy upgrade path. Whereas in the future, like 19 to 19 to 20 X series will have a more difficult thing. But we're not there yet, so this upgrade should be pretty smooth. So if you're interested, I'll have a link to the in the show notes for the latest release of Linux Mint 19.2. Up next in the show is some kernel news. So Linux seems to be waving goodbye to floppy drives. And this regards to uh, hardware support for old drives that use like IDE and that kind of thing to connect to uh, their hardware. So the main thing is, is because floppy drives are super ancient. They're basically like historical relics at this point. And it's kind of funny because I was I, I, I assumed that Linux had support for it, but I completely forgot that floppy drives existed. The only time I ever think about floppy drives is where when I make a joke about the 3D printed save icon, aka floppy drives, or floppy disks, and uh, it's just, anyway. It's kind of interesting because they're removing support for the, uh, the old drives, the old hardware, but they're not removing support for floppy disks in general. So if you use 
uh, a, a floppy drive that is powered through or connected through USB, those will still work. So you can actually still use floppy disks. It's just the super ancient old hardware that are, is, would be ridiculous to continue to use anyway. Uh, those would be uh, removed for support. Uh, the, those, those legacy drivers would be removed, but the actual support for floppy disks would still exist if you're using an adapter with a USB or you get one of those uh, like on Amazon or whatever, there's like a $20 uh, drive where you can have like just direct access through USB. Uh, I'm not really sure if they're actually that much money, but roughly around that much. Uh, they're not that expensive is what I'm saying. But if you do use floppy disks through USB, you're fine. If you first, why would, I don't If you do use floppy disks for USB, please let me know why. I would like to know why you still use floppy disks. But anyway, the old hardware is being removed and I think that's uh, totally justifiable. Up next in the show is some more Linux kernel news, and that is Valve has proposed some game-friendly changes to the kernel. So we've been talking about Valve for a lot, uh, a lot of the episodes and many topics in cases on some episodes, that you know, it might seem like that we've heavily covered it and in the show. And that's because we have, because Valve has done a lot of stuff. So every time there's a new thing that Valve ha- does, it's some, we, we cover it because it's pretty important in a lot of the times. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, they've actually done uh, the latest proposal is that they are uh, trying to improve the CPU, uh, like the ability to uh, pr- have better performance for multi-threaded games and multi-threaded applications through the CPU. So Valve has pushed the the patches themselves already in their production for their clients and their projects, and are waiting on the kernel to see if they will take advantage of it of the of the improvements that they're suggesting. And so far, this, the good news is that the Linux kernel team seems to be responding well to the code and is working with Valve on various tweaks to it. So it's not necessarily ready yet to be pushed in the kernel, but the developers are, the kernel developers have said that you know it does have potential and that they are willing to do it as long as it's improved in certain areas, and Valve is working on improving those things. So this has a lot of imp- and, like possible impact, not only just for gamers, but also for non-gamers because it will improve multi-threading applications as well, making it be- better, a more better experience for, in general for everyone on the Linux desktop. So this is definitely a big win for the, the Linux you know, ecosystem. And it's one of those things that might not seem like a very important thing because it's like a very, uh, you know, deep down kernel level change that has improvements that don't seem that much like it's like a five percent improvement for performance but overall because it's improving you know it improves a lot of things it makes it possible to do a lot more stuff for example five percent improvement on proton is actually improved and is is better because it makes it better uh, support for different games that are not necessarily linux native so that's a great possibility and there's also other things that valve is doing and we're going to get to those in a second but overall it might not seem like a lot but it, it is a significant portion, and I hope that they do, uh, you know, come to an agreement to improve it because having improvements to, like, the, the, the F-Sync patches and the glibc and all the stuff that they're doing has potential to be very impactful for the overall ecosystem. Another thing that Valve is involved with that is definitely obvious, and, and you can see the impact that it could have, in that they're working with Collabora to develop the XR desktop. Now, what the XR desktop is essentially doing is it enables interactions with traditional desktop environments in a virtual reality space. So this is awesome because it has the possibility of making Linux window managers aware of VR and able to use VR runtimes to render the desktops in a 3D space, given the ability to manipulate them with VR controllers and all that. It's very interesting. So it has support for Valve Index and the HTC Vive, and it's not limited only to VR compositors, which is one of the things that uh, the VR uh, ecosystem currently has to deal with. But now, using this XR desktop, it makes it possible to integrate with a variety of existing Linux and desktop environments. Now, currently, their only initial focus is on GNOME and KDE, but it's designed to work with any desktop. So at some point, their hope is to have all desktops supported. But right now, they're only supporting GNOME and KDE. So uh, but that's pretty cool any, either way because, you know, you have to start somewhere, and this is still pretty awesome. Like, this is, this is amazing that they're even doing this because it kind of, like, pulls into the, the idea of, like, Minority Report where you have all your windows in a 3D space. Like, obviously not the same thing, but 
it's still really awesome that you could do that. So you could, they show demonstrations of like resizing and, and scaling and moving around the applications and all kinds of stuff that it, it like, it looks like it has a ton of potential and it makes it possible for people to do all sorts of stuff with VR. Cause it, cause every, at that point, every application that is on the Linux desktop would be able to support VR usage, which is really awesome. It's also kind of interesting to, to note that uh, the Windows experience for VR is not very good because when you go into VR for Windows applications, you basically just have a virtual monitor that you're sitting in front of that just shows them exactly the same way as if you were just looking at it on a regular monitor, which is like, so you go into VR to look at another monitor to then use the same things that you would use. It's like, why would you even do that? What's the point? Who cares at that point? But so that's cool because it means that it might show that Linux as a, in, in, as a desktop in virtual reality is going to get there faster than Windows because of the work that Valve and Collabora are doing to make this XR desktop project. So this is pretty awesome and has a lot of potential, and I can't wait to try it out because, you know, as a KDE Plasma fan, I think this is going to be awesome. So uh, if you'd like to see it more, I actually am. If you want to check out the video version of this episode, you can see a... A video demonstrating the grabbing of a uh, application in KDE where you can like use the VR controllers to manipulate the application where you spin it move it around and move it up and down and everything so it shows you how the v the VR 3d space works with an application so definitely check out this uh, video version if you are ch- listening to the audio podcast uh, it might be worth checking out there but I'll have a link to the collabora post on their website, their blog, talking about all the things they're doing. You'll have a link to those videos there as well. So uh, check out the link in the show notes for the VR Linux desktop, XR desktop. This episode of This Week in Linux is also made possible by the Tux Digital patrons over on Patreon and sponsors. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Patreon or tuxdigital.com slash sponsors to become a patron. Now, to become a patron, all it takes is on uh, well, as low as $1 on Patreon or as low as $3 on sponsors. The reason for the difference is the transaction fee structure because there's a significant portion uh, for the $1 on sponsors due to how the transactions work. And that's actually kind of true on Patreon now, but the Tux Digital uh, channel is got grandfathered in on a different structure, so it's cheaper on Patreon, which makes it possible to do that $1 thing. Uh, but anyway, if by becoming a patron, you're not only just supporting the channel and the podcast, you're also going to be able to get rewards and perks by being like different tiers, whichever one you select to be a part of. And you're going to get benefits that's like early access to episodes, uh, access to be a part of a live stream, uh, a monthly live stream that I'm starting to do for patrons, and many more things, uh, including potential uh, swag that we're working, I'm working on, maybe doing, uh, definitely going to be doing some, like some discounts for people who are patrons to get merchandise for like the Linux is everywhere t-shirt and that kind of thing. So if you would like to, not only you're going to getting, uh, you're benefiting the channel, you're also going to be able to get some rewards and perks by being a part of a, uh, being a patron of the channel. So again, if you want to, you want to become a patron, you can go to touchdigital.com slash sponsors or touchdigital.com slash Patreon to learn more. And thank you to everyone who is contributing at the moment for being a patron. It's amazing, and it makes this, makes it possible for me to actually do this show. So thank you very much for your contributions. Up next in the show is some news from the System76 crew about a new Linux laptop that they're releasing called the Adder WS. The Adder WS is a 15.6-inch 4K OLED laptop with NVIDIA RTX 2070 graphics. This, is, this laptop is actually not out yet, but it will be coming out pretty soon. Uh, it says August 8th is when they're going to be announcing the, the release for it. Uh, so right now, it's not as the recording is not out yet, but it will be released pretty soon. So this this laptop also comes up has up to a like has a CPU that can go up to eight core Intel i9 options, and also options for up to 64 gigs of RAM. And you can also get some uh, two, two M.2 SATA or PCIe NVMe drives for the storage, as well as another drive for the hard, like the you know actual storage. But this is like for like the system stuff. And they also have 
uh, a nice multicolor backlit keyboard. So if you want to have like, you know, you can choose whatever color you want to have the keyboard to do the backlit, which is really cool. They've also have two type C, uh, USB type C ports. And the thing that's cool about these is that one of them supports display port and the other one supports the Thunderbolt. So you can have a, you know, you can do video out through the USB type C as well as video out for a full, with a full size HDMI port as well as a mini display port. So you can have up to three external displays if you want to based on this hardware. And you also have uh, more, three more USB 3.0 and an SD card reader uh, slots. And another thing that's cool about it is that they said that they're disabling the management engine. So like the Intel management engine is by default in, disabled with this hardware. So that is really cool. So this seems like a beast of a laptop. And it has a lot of potential hardware uh, options. You can do crazy stuff with this thing, uh, especially you know in a laptop form factor. Uh, they've also said that they're they're going to have multiple different operating system options. So uh, naturally, it's going to have Pop OS as the uh, System76 operating system. Pop OS is going to be available for both in versions of 18.04 and 19.04. But they're also going to be including uh, Ubuntu 18.04 as an option as well. So if you don't want to have their modifications through Pop! OS, you can choose to use the Ubuntu 18.04 version instead. And also, you can just download the ISO in later on if you do want to have Pop! OS. So basically, you can choose whichever one you want because it's based on Linux. You can just have, you know, you can switch, you know, move things back and forth however you want because that's one of the best things about Linux. As long as the hardware supports it, you can use pretty much anything. And that's one of the things about getting something from System76 because they focus on Linux support, showing that knowing that basically every thing that you want to run on Linux will work on this laptop. So that is awesome. Check if you want to check out the the latest release of the Adder WS from System76. I'll have it to, a link to it in the show notes. Up next in the show is some more hardware news, and in this case is the some mobile hardware from the Purism team for the Librem 5 Linux smartphone. They've finalized the specs for the hardware, and they've announced what the final specs will be. So this is a phone that was that was funded, uh, crowdfunded back in 2017, and they have shown that they're they're giving the, the specs. Like the main thing that they're talking about with this phone is that it's a privacy oriented phone. It's a Linux based operating system uh, approach. And it's not meant to be, it's not like a, you know, just another Android device. It's a full um, operating system based on Linux with PureOS, for example. And also it is a free software oriented thing because PureOS is also endorsed by the Free Software Foundation as being a, you know, fully, full, a fully free software operating system. And... There's a lot of stuff that's in here that's gonna be this really cool because they have the they have the kill switches for like the camera, the mic, the Wi-Fi, and the baseband, making it possible for you to you know just make sure you have as full pro uh, privacy, knowing that you're not being tracked in any way. Like the open like the uh, the operating system that's running on it is not doing it anyway, but in this case they give you an extra hardware to make sure that you can guarantee that it will be disabled in, in you know, because you've, you've said it so that even if the hard, the software wanted to and somehow there's a malicious application that gets in the, in the market or whatever, it still can't do it anything anyway. So that's really cool. And it's, it's more of like an enthusiast phone because it is kind of expensive and the hardware specs are not that good. So I kind of want it to be good. You know, I do want it the, this to be a successful phone because I've been wanting a Linux-based smartphone for a very long time. But this is a pretty expensive phone, and the hardware is not that good. So I'm sorry to be like the negative person in this particular case. I don't like to typically be negative, and even show you know have articles on the show that I'm that I'm negative about. But this is like one of those where it's a pretty big topic, and I'm, it's just it's just kind of disappointing, really. So the Librem Five phone is at a price of $700 or $699 plus tax. So $700 and it has a 5.7 inch screen that is at 720p resolution. Okay. It has a IMX8M quad core with a clock, max clock speed of 1.5 gigahertz processor. And 3 gigs of memory, 32 gigs of internal storage, Micro SD card slot, which is good. Uh, it does have a courage jack, which is AKA a headphone jack. It has an expandable bat or a, a replaceable battery. It has a 35 milliamp uh, hour battery, but is also replaceable, so that's great. 
and it has uh, Bluetooth 4.0 support. It has support for 3G and 4G modems. It has a GPS built in with an, and also has an 8 megapixel front camera with a 13 megapixel uh, back camera. And, you know, it, it's not terrible specs. It's, they're not bad specs. Overall, they're pretty decent specs, but they're not $700 quality specs. So, in comparison, if you look at uh, phones that were released from like from t- right now this year, uh, there are phones that are ridiculously more powerful. So, like for example, if you give out a seven hundred dollar phone from Samsung, like the the S ten E, the Galaxy S ten E, for example, it has uh, by default like the minimum has six gigs of memory for RAM, and it has up to eight gigs of RAM if you wanted it to, if you paid a little bit extra. But it has a ten eighty p screen. Um, I'm pretty sure it has that. It might even be more, uh, like a better quality screen. It might even be a 1440p screen. I'm not, I don't remember. But it's definitely more than 720. And it has twice as much RAM. It has twice as much storage by default. So it's 32 gigs for the, the Librem 5 and 64 gigs for the S10e. And, you know, I could say, yes, you could argue that the Samsung devices are created, like they're they're cheaper and they're more powerful because they have a big manufacturer on them. And... Libra, or Purism is not that big of a company, so they can't really do that kind of thing. And that's a fair point. That's a fair point. And it is also fair to say that this is not necessarily meant to be the latest and greatest hardware phone to you know topple the big companies. But at the same time, they're not really they're not seemingly upfront about what this is for. So like for me, this feels like it's a phone for an enthusiast. It's from it's a phone for someone who cares about privacy. It cares about Linux being the operating system power, like the full Linux operating system, and it and it feels to me like it's a phone that is for someone who doesn't necessarily care about paying a premium for those benefits to get all those because the pre- it is a pretty big premium. It's a few hundred dollar premium in order to get these because even if you don't take about take consideration the new phones, if you take if you just look at the older phones, like for example a OnePlus 5T is an old phone that was made in 2017, I think, and it has more uh, more memory. I think it has a 4-gig memory, and it has uh, more storage space. It has, it has an SD card slot. It has um, a USB Type-C, and it has a much better uh, screen. Uh, and it, it's not like not huge much better, but it's like a 1080p screen, and it's currently like $350, $400 online, depending on where you go can't really give you an exact number at the moment but uh it's roughly around that price and it's more powerful like it's better hardware specs in they were it was created two years ago and it's cheaper and it has support for lineage and also e the slash e slash that's a weird name so uh based on like it used to be called elo or something that operating system looks pretty cool but you need to work on the name because that's not a very good name that is ridiculously hard to search for, so try to you know not do that. Anyway, um, that it has the OnePlus 5T has support for both of those as well as other things, and it's a cheaper it's a cheaper cost. It's more powerful hardware, and you still get the benefit of having um, you know the privacy aspects to it. So at the same time, it's hard for me to say go out and get this phone because the specs are not that good and it kind of gets a little worse in a a way like if you think about it so like there's more there's cheaper devices that are more powerful there's prices or there's devices that are at the same price print range that are way more powerful and then there's also devices that are similar specs that are coming out pretty soon well not this pretty soon but roughly this year that will be ridiculously cheaper so, for example, the Pine Phone from Pine64, also making the Pine Book, or the Pine Book Pro and everything. So, they're making the Pine Phone, and they've given the specs of what they're going to use as well. They're using the All Winner A64 quad core chip. Now, the, the A Winner 64 is based on an ARM Cortex A53. The IMX8 from the Librem 5 is also based on a, a Cortex A53. A- a- so, it's a very similar. I mean, I can't really get. I couldn't find specs and like performance between the two, but they seem to be very similar, if not in the same like space in general. 
um, but they do seem very similar. And it's also going to have a 720p screen. It's also going to have a micro SD card slot. Uh, it will have less space, storage space of 16 gigs of RAM, or not 16 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of storage. And it's going to have two gigs of RAM instead of the three gigs for the Librem 5. Uh, it will also have USB Type C with the video out, just like the Librem 5. It'll have support for the same version of Bluetooth 4.0, have GPS support, all that stuff. It won't have as powerful as a camera. It'll have a 5 megapixel camera instead of the 14, I think it said, or thir no, 13 megapixels for the Librem 5. And, you know, all that. And it won't have as powerful as a battery. Instead of the 3,500 milliamp hour, it'll have a 3,000 milliamp hour uh, that will also be replaceable. Um, and overall, they're even going to have the benefit of the privacy stuff because they're going to have three external switches. Um, well, the, uh, well, I'm not th not not sure about three actually because uh, there's external switches for like the power and stuff. But there's also going to be external switches for or hardware switches for the LTE, uh, the Wi-Fi, the microphone, and the stuff like that turning it off. Like similar to how the your Librem Five is going to have the hardware switches to turn off things. They're going to have you're going to be able to turn it off through the Pine Phone as well. So basically, the hardware is very similar. Like, it's definitely underpowered compared to the Proliferum 5. The Pine Phone is less powerful, but not that much. It's not that much power, less powerful. 2 gigs of RAM, 3 gigs of RAM. 16 gigs of storage, 32 gigs of storage. And with the SD card slot, you can kind of, you know, bypass, bypass that eMMC limitation on either one. And, and the rest of the, rest of the stuff is very similar. The only thing that's not that similar is the uh, camera's power, like the camera having a 5 megapixel versus a 13 megapixel and having a 2 megapixel front camera versus a 8 megapixel um, front camera for the Librem 5. Now, they're very similar, but there's definitely some difference. And the hardware difference for the Librem 5 is definitely a better, better piece of hardware, but the price comparison is ridiculous. The price for the Pine Phone has stated to be in the range of $150. So $700, $150. Is it a like based on with the taxes and everything, you're looking at probably a $550 price difference. Is the hardware difference between those two phones $550 worth of hardware? Not really. And the idea that, you know, the, the enthusiast market of wanting a Linux phone and everything, yeah, there is that. But the same thing can be done with the Pine Phone, apparently. I mean, the Pine Phone's not out yet. Librem 5's not out yet either. Because they say quarter three for the Librem 5, and the Pine, Pine Company hasn't actually announced the release date. But hopefully sometime this year is what, is what uh, the, the rumors are going around as far as the Pine Phone comes out. So at the same time, it's weird because I want the Librem 5 to be successful, and I want Purism as a company who's backing Linux, and their sole purpose is being a Linux hardware company. I love that. But the the specs are just not very good. They're just, they're just not. Especially for, I mean, if that price was not $700, those specs would be okay. $400 device, maybe even a $500 device. Mm -mm preferably $400 based on the hardware. If it was that, I'd be way more happy to promote it and recommend it. But at this point, the specs versus that $700 price point, it's just it's just too expensive. So if you do want to check out the Librem 5 and the, sp the final specs and everything, and you, and you are interested in getting the phone, I'll have a link to it in the show notes. But uh, yeah, I think the phone has potential... I just think the price is a little bit too much, but I'll have a link to it anyway in the show notes. Up next in the show is some news from Manjaro. So quite a, a little while back, a couple months ago or so, uh, Canonical had a like a Snap development summit, and they uh, invited uh, the developer M Philip Mueller from Manjaro to uh, come to it and kind of like experience how Snaps would work and you know try to convince them to put Snaps in, M in Manjaro. And they have actually done so. So this latest uh, announcement is that Manjaro is going to be including Snaps f so that you can have Snap Store access for the various different editions of Manjaro. Now, they're only going to be starting with the th with three of them at the moment. The KDE Plasma, the XFCE, and the GNOME GNOME editions will have uh, support for Manjaro. 
I mean, for the snaps store in the Manjaro. Uh, and in the future, there might be other additions that will have support as well, but for now, just these three. Uh, and there's also been some other news regarding Manjaro that has been a little bit dramatic and a little overblown, in my opinion. But at the same time, the result kind of makes it good. You know, like, is the drama resulting in something good in this case? Yes. But is it really necessary for this drama to happen? Not really. So, anyway, Manjaro has had announced on their forum in the next release for 18.1 that they would be replacing LibreOffice with FreeOffice. And now this came out with a lot of criticism regarding, you know, people being disappointed that the distribution seems to be dropping the open source software approach and the free software stuff. And, you know, by adding this proprietary uh, software, it kind of like negates their, uh, you know, the perceived uh, aspect of the distribution of not, you know, being for free software and everything. But Manjaro is not really that anyway. So, like, they have Steam by default, you know, you, and that's proprietary, so if you, you automatically get Steam as a client built in, so that's not, they're not necessarily focused totally on the free software thing, but I still understand why people were bothered by uh, free, the free office, because there are some issues that free office had. For example, free office had an issue where it didn't uh, support to saving to Microsoft Office formats, so you couldn't save in PowerPoint or Doc or XLS files and that kind of thing. Uh, you could open those, but you couldn't save it. So it kind of made like, it kind of made sense that some people would be bothered by that. But I didn't see many people talking about that. Most of the time, the drama was around the, you know, just because it was proprietary, not because of that kind of problem. Uh, but anyway, based on all of this, uh, you know, drama that was happening around this particular decision, they've said that they are uh, working on making some modifications to this thing. So they're going to be making it possible to uh, have a uh, ability to select an Office Suite. They say, we are currently working on a new module to, to select the Office Suite you may want to install in Manjaro 18.1. They also say the RC5 and RC6 installer images included with FreeOffice uh, so they, they could be tested. Based on that feedback, SoftMaker, the people who make FreeOffice, are making changes to the free edition of their Office Suite then this benefits all users of the free edition, whether they're using Linux or Microsoft or whatever. So it's it's interesting because by doing this, they kind of created a little bit of a drama that made them have a better overall outcome, but and also benefited the users of the free office because SoftMaker made a tweet saying that they have agreed to make changes so that it's possible to save Microsoft Office formats such as PowerPoint, Docs, and XLS in the free version, you know, because of this kind of whatever this was. So it's weird because when I first heard about this, people were freaking out over or having this, this weird drama over this issue. I didn't really think that it was that big of a deal. However, it did make sense that people got bothered by the fact that it didn't have support for saving to these formats. Even though their, their big claim to fame is being able to use those formats, they didn't have the ability to save. And that part was very valid as in a sense like, what are you doing being that's making the default? But at the same time, it made the soft maker people uh, add the feature for the free edition. It made it possible for Manjaro to give you an option for the users to have a, no office suite apparently, or also choosing which office suite you want. So, and the outcome was overall good. So, it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, the the Ubuntu 32-bit stuff was this big outrage thing that resulted in a good decision because of that. In this case, it's some more outrage stuff. I mean, I don't really think it's a huge thing, but it was some more outrage stuff that resulted in some improvements to the overall future of the Manjaro project has in by you know convinced the company who makes that software to uh, change the way they do the free version so you know, that's pretty good it's just i don't know what do you think about this it's an interesting situation because i think that this was a little overblown um in many ways but at the same time because of them not having support for those formats it kind of made sense kind of justified a little bit of the uh, the outrage aspect uh or the drama anyway um but them changing it kind of says like is the outrage aspect in like 
is that a weapon or a tool to improve the ecosystem based on the decisions that are made? Or is that something that is just overdone and overblown and people shouldn't be re- overreacting in these cases? I don't know. Just let me know what you think in the comments below because I think this would be a good discussion to have on this topic. So, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. And I'll have a link to the Forbes article talking about this particular thing as well as the updates from the SoftMaker stuff in the uh, show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest release of Latte Dock. 0.9 brings better settings and layout enhancements to the overall experience of Latte Dock. So after a full year of development, the Latte Dock has been released 0.9, and there's a lot of new features in it, uh, including new color painting, which makes it so that the Latte can paint itself based on the current active window. So if you have like you're using a certain window, you can make it where it adjusts it so when it connects, to, like it'll blend in with the window itself. So that's pretty cool. It also makes it possible to have better improvement for contrast on the transparencies uh, effects. Uh, they've actually added new indicators that are that are available that can be installed from a Latte effects page. They have uh, set up multiple layouts environment, so you can have various different layouts. Like one of the cool things about Latte Doc that's not really known is that Latte Doc has a layout system that you can change instead of just being a dock, you can say, uh, use this for uh, like a unity style or something like that. And it will adjust itself to fit that style. So they're adding a new uh, multiple layout environment for that st- that kind of thing. They've also redesigned the settings for the dock and panel, making it more, like, make it more obvious of how that works. They've also improved some badges, uh, bug fixes, uh, performance improvements. They've actually improved documentation and stuff. And even their uh, error reporting uh, stuff has been improved as well. So there's quite a few things on this particular thing, on this particular uh, update. And I think Latte Dock is one of the coolest things that you can do in Plasma. Uh, I'm not sure if it's exclusive in Plasma. I think it also works in LXQ, but I haven't tried it myself. Uh, but I think it, I think it does. Uh, but the the Latte Dock is awesome in Plasma for many reasons. One, it's a really good dock. It has a lot of cool features. It has a lot of customizations and really cool like polished stuff like you know the whole color changing and the transparency effects and that kind of thing it also has really good intellihide and all that but what makes it really cool what's really impressive about it is that it supports plasma widgets so you can essentially replace your plasma panels with a latte dock in every way you can still have all the benefits of having the plasmoids or the widgets and applets or whatever uh, they, they have different names depending on who you talk to um, but these widgets are all supported so that you can put in your system clock, your task manager, your application menu, your uh, your system tray. All that stuff can be put into a Latte dock, uh, dock or panel, making it possible to replace the existing panels with a much more powerful panel via the Latte dock. So it's a really cool idea. I actually typically replace the panels on my setups uh, on most of the time. So uh, Latte dock is pretty cool. If you'd like to learn more about this particular release, I'll have a link to the latest post about Latte Dock in the show notes below. Finally this week is some really cool news from Valve. They have added some more games to the Steam Play or Proton whitelist. And these games are like there's about I think there's about a few like a few couple dozen that have been added in this particular thing, but it also is really cool because it now sets the title. Like when it first started, the whitelist had maybe 20 games. It's now at 168 titles in the whitelist, which is really cool. Now, a couple of these games I've been wanting to play for a very long time, and I'm super excited that it, they've been added to the whitelist uh, because that means they're, they're going to be supported uh, heavily. Uh, now, first of all, Outlast 2 is added. That's really cool. I'm excited about trying that one. Uh, there's also some really old games that are kind of like remastered. For example, Fallout and Fallout 2 are now added to the whitelist. DX Ball 2, which is like a, you know, uh, 20 years ago, was like a, you know, big uh, like breakout type game. Uh, it's like they're actually, this is the 20th anniversary edition that's supported in the whitelist. They've also done a remastered version of DuckTales. Yeah. For anybody who's, you know, roughly my age, you might know if that little TV show, that or cartoon, you know. Anyway, they've also uh, added a game that I've been wanting to play for a very long time. That I, you probably could have played it for a while in Proton. That I just didn't, you know, I just didn't bother. But now that it's on the whitelist, it makes me even more interested in doing it. And that is Cuphead. So Cuphead was a super popular game last year. Uh, you know, it was very, very uh, popular in terms of like people wanting to play it. 
even though it was only a single player game, but it was it was so stylized and so interesting that people wanted to try it out. And I am excited to be able to do that now, and maybe I'll do a sh- live stream of it playing the game on uh, Proton with it. So we'll see. If you're interested in that, let me know in the comments below, and I will, you know, more than likely do it. But I have to. I'm waiting on getting some better hardware to make that possible. But as soon as that's possible, I will definitely do that. Uh, but let me know if you are interested in that as well, because it'll probably if I were to do it, it'd probably be on like Twitch or Mixer and not YouTube. Because uh, a lot of people who are uh, fans of the show don't really care about live streaming games, so I understand that. So instead, uh, so I'd focus more on the platforms that are specific for gaming, or not really specific for gaming, but most popular for gaming, which would be Twitch and Mixer. Um, so anyway, if you are interested, let me know uh, about that. And but I'll have a link to all the games on, for the Gaming on Linux article, the GamingOnLinux.com article in the show notes that shows all the games that were added to the whitelist recently. Because this is pretty cool. And you might have one of these games that you want to play, or you might check out like the old classics like Fallout and Fallout 2. You know, whatever. Anyway, I have a link to those in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. We also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux, as I'm a co-host of that show. And just a reminder, this show is live usually every Saturday, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Now, the past couple of episodes, it hasn't been live, so if you've looked for it and think you missed it, you actually didn't miss it. I was unable to do the show live on those episodes, and that is because I've been working on quite a few things that I'm building up to release fairly soon. There's some big news coming. I can't necessarily tell you what it is yet, but it is coming, and it's going to be fairly soon and pretty big. So that's why I haven't been able to do it live, but this upcoming episode, I will be trying to do it live this weekend on Saturday, so be sure to check it out. And uh, if you can make it, I'd love to see you and uh, have, a t- have a chat with you about all the Linux news that we've, uh, we're have we going to cover this week. And also, if you want to talk about anything previous weeks, feel free to do that as well. So thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.